Hello, everyone, and welcome to the September 25th analytics section meeting. Um, very light agenda, but some good topics to discuss. Want to get everyone's thoughts on this. Um, so James and I were discussing application limits and how we want to like define them, and that involves things. Do we have an, uh, an issue link for that, James? Oh, I'll um, find it while you're talking. No worries. The, the general context is like we want to figure out how we can put in place an application limit, since a part of that is defining it. But uh, uh, even though we define things like you know request per second and things like that, or or how we how we actually want to define those limits, uh, we need to understand what's actually possible within our stack. And so, um, you know, I don't think we really have anything in place with, and I don't think it's necessarily the responsibility of the collector to to really be aware of who it, or which events it can and can't accept. But ideally, um, when we're taking in events from from different application IDs, that we have the ability to shut them off based on the usage data that we're starting to collect. Um, you know, Max has been working on that and actually just posted a new release with the configurator to be able to query on that. So, you know, theoretically, if we have a feedback loop of being able to see how many events are being uh, received and how many we're actually processing and things like that, we want to be able to say, hey, um, you know, perspective beta or beta user, you are approaching the data data storage limit or events collected limit. And how can we actually control that? So we're actually open to ideas here um, on, on what's possible. Done some research into using something like GCP Cloud Armor to be able to say, hey, uh, based on certain headers coming in, um, if we were to, for example, send an application ID through a header, then we can start to block requests in that way. But we need to kind of close the loop there in terms of, okay, we see how much people are using. We may have some uh, users that are using too much, especially in the beta phase where we're trying to test things out. Um, related, you know, GitLab.com is firing uh, 100 now, and uh, it's I'm, I'm seeing a lot of crash loopback <laughs> happening in the cluster right now. So um, it's important that we put these these uh, application limits in place so that um, we have a little bit more control, especially as we are launching with shared shared cluster environments that um, you know customers that are or users that are using more than others don't disrupt uh, other other users as well. So. Um, yeah, Max, you raise your hand. Uh, yeah, I think this could be really difficult to solve. I'm not saying we shouldn't. Um, so like in previous roles, I worked on applications that had no traffic 99% of the time. And then in relation to, I don't know, an advert or a call out from a YouTuber or something like that, they would suddenly get what would appear to be an abusive number of events. And if they lost that data, that would be, you know, incredibly damaging because it's a very, very valuable data for them for the 1% the of the time where they're actually dealing with any sort of meaningful traffic. Um, I don't know how we handle that. And it obviously does need to be handled. Um, I like the idea of saying, you know, we, you're, you're using this much most of the time. So an unexpected spike would be considered abusive, but we also don't want to lose our customers' data. And I don't know what the answer is, but it certainly is considering. Yeah, I think Part of it is just understanding what's possible. I think, um, and and James, correct me if I'm wrong. Like, I think this has. That's a fair point. Like, one thing we want to do is like test like surging, and there's no way of saying like, hey, you have a you have a request per second limit when yeah, you know, the holiday rolls around or some you know marketing event happens where you have a certain traffic, and then we don't want to we, we want to be able to capture all of that. So I don't know how feasible it is when we're in general availability, but I think. A lot of the focus, at least right in the short term, has been around just making sure that we have a stable environment for, or a semi-stable environment for for when we're in beta. And you know, in beta, we'll be theoretically opening this up to anyone who wants to opt in using the experiments toggle. Um, but at the same time, it's a balance of like what's possible, how much work is involved actually to enforce these limits, and then um, does it then make sense to even implement it because of you know, uh, to your point, like we don't want to lose any of that data just because oh we set these policies or set these thresholds of even if it's like a 10 percent buffer or whatever like that if it just exceeds it based on some sale or marketing event and like yeah it, we, we lose almost our entirely our value to to customers just because uh we wanted to save theory you know however much it costs to, to process these events yeah we can um as we get to more external users and users who are using this more for customers customers kind of beyond our initial um user persona of your platform team, your tools team, most of your users are internal, so it should be fairly steady state, then we can start to implement things uh, with the field team around, hey, we are expecting a bump. 
because we're expecting additional traffic for whatever it might be. And there's going to be funky outliers. I think we should focus on the initial use case of, hey, let's just not let somebody accidentally DDoS us and deal with consequences of it, especially through beta, where data loss is a little bit expected and built in, and we can learn from that. Um, but getting something in place to prevent that on the front end and then uh, getting some sane limits put in place of how much are we going to store is kind of the what we're looking for, the outcome that we want out of this issue, this discussion, and then what we can implement uh, throughout the beta. Fair point, yeah. Max. I, I've been there for Black Friday. I, yeah, from I my... It's... Go ahead, Rob. I was only going to say, the only thing I can, that, that I've had experience with analytics before, and the two things that we normally limited were to do with individual users, putting a time, how many events we would track per user per second, say five events per second or something like that, and then how many events per day or set period of time we'd provide per user. Um, because realistically, a normal user isn't going to be spamming refresh constantly, necessarily, over a short period of time. Um, and that was how we reduced or put limits, but we didn't limit how many events overall we would send or collect for the website. Yeah, I think that's what we can start to figure out is like, um, and, and what I'm coming to, to realize is I think our first iteration is one, just having visibility into um, that amount of like, I think I think it's going to be important to have that uh, insight into like the users and how much they're, how many events they're sending and then being able to figure out, okay, do we have the means to, by which we can actually exclude specific users? Like we have customers that in the same way that, you know, we have API limits and in the beginnings of that, we were able to at least identify who was hitting our API the most to be able to say, hey, this is probably out of the ordinary. I think we want to be lenient to start, but then start to figure out like, okay, for, you know, these users are sending tens of thousands compared to hundreds of events a day. Um, and then being able to to, to exclude them, um, it may be a, a good like first or second iteration, um, and then we can kind of move from there. At the same yeah. time, oh, sorry, Basti. Yeah, I think from my perspective, for like a first iteration, if our main concern is that we don't bring down the whole system, or some, one user, like James said, doesn't DDoS us accidentally, then I don't know if how much we actually need to look at the, like compare um, how much a specific um, customer has used us before and how much they're using us now, but instead just put in an overall limit of, okay, a uh, based on our infrastructure and maybe what we want to pay for it, as long as it's kind of somewhat elastic to the infrastructure, um, we just have an overall limit of, okay, we for now we don't expect a single customer to exceed X amount of events per second and just kind of put a hard limit on that. That's also something we could communicate that, okay, this is not made for your Black Friday um, special super sale yet. Um, so we, we just kind of put that hard limit in place. It seems to me like that would maybe be a lot easier to implement than if you need to consider kind of how a something changed over time and it should still protect us from this, okay, one customer just searches so much that they um, impact the, the the experience of other customers because I think from what I understand that's I mean the main the main problems we could have is either one customer just ddosing and 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 creating a bad experience for everyone else or if we have completely kind of elastic infrastructure some one customer just creating too much cost in a um, in a beta environment where they don't have to pay yet and so there there's no kind of um, they could just use it. Uh, because it's cheap uh, or it's 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 free and then um, and, and and kind of misuse us that way. Yeah, Basti, I think you nailed it. The the first use case is that DDoS one. And if, as long as we can start to understand how many events we're storing and where the cost is, we can build out then cost models around what do later limits look like uh, from a how long we're going to store something, how much of something we're going to store. Um, as we get into more pricing and packaging. So that's really what I wanted to drive with this discussion and this issue is how do we, one, prevent the DDoS case, and then two, uh, capture the data we need to understand the, the pricing and packaging. So um, great discussion. I wanted to then kind of segue into uh, how can we at this stage kind of inform what we can do for the former, 
What do we have? Dennis, you, you mentioned um, something on the Google side already. Um, are there other things that we can do within Snowplow or some of the other stack to implement a larger or more <laughs> broad uh, case that applies to everyone? If this is how many events per second per user or whatever the right um, nomenclature is uh, during our beta for product analytics that ensures we get that reliability and stability we're looking for. Yeah, I think we're really going to, so the, the the first two things that comes to mind is like, one, we need the visibility because we we don't have, like, we need to understand the cost, but also we need to understand how much data we're getting and to actually have any idea of like what a sensible limit would be. Otherwise, it's just all theoretical at this point. Um, and then also understanding what's possible. So there's Cloud Armor. There's also, I know a lot of our uh, services are behind Cloudflare and, um, you know, they have data, DDoS protection as well. So it's, it's, it's trying to understand where we can leverage this type of protection before and then eventually integrating that with our visibility into the data and, and what limits we want to place there. Um, after which, like, so uh, this is recorded, but I mean, okay, anyways, like the collectors are raw endpoints, right? So like they're just directly pointing at our load balancers. Um, and so if that means that Cloudflare has to manage these endpoints so that we get those DDoS protections in place, and then that's what we need to understand. And so I'm trying to understand, uh, I'm trying to investigate from the infrastructure side of things, like what's what's possible there. Um, after that, we can see, like, sorry, it's like confusing. Like, we know what's, what we can do and we know, you know how much we're using and we can kind of put two, two together to eventually figure out the the, the, the limits we would want to start to, to, to put in place. Does that make sense? Cool. So what are next steps then for us to implement that either within product analytics or across the whole stage? Or to gather that information. Yeah, so I would say uh, two issues to start is to do the analysis of like current usage and then costs related to that. And then secondly, uh, what is possible uh, in terms of actually enforcing these limits um, if we have values to put in place there. So that could be front of stack, just infrastructure, like. It, it because it makes sense from what Basti is saying is like you know what what, what limits we want to place in terms of just overall costs of how we allow these shared clusters to scale and so ideally it would be in front of even the clusters or at least at the, at the cluster level I don't know that it necessarily means and it probably shouldn't be uh, specific to like Snowplow or any type of service in the stack um, it will likely be a layer in front of that but anyways those are the first two issues I'd start and I think we'll have a better idea of where we go from there once we complete these two but I'm curious to um, other people's thoughts. One approach we've ta I've taken in the past is to run up a run a duplicate production um, instance and then run something like Taurus, the load testing tool, um, and run a couple of scenarios and just ramp it up until you break, and then you know scale up the copy the test cluster at different limits to see you know what sort of uh, what, what sort of uh, to see the different budget ranges you'd hit based upon. How much data you're inputting i mean with us our scenarios are collector processing events and then also uh from a product analytics perspective cube querying for events both sessions and normal page view type events so we'd want to run a couple of different scenarios at the same time and see what sort of limits we already have in production right now and what that looks like if we scale up, scale production by 20% or whatever, how many more can we hit based on? And then from that, you can do your cost analysis from an infra point of view. Yeah, I think we need the, the metric set up first. And I forgot to mention logging and monitoring is going to be an important part of that since we have to measure which parts of the stacks are, are healthy and not. Um, which I, I got a point of contact to, to push forward. So hopefully I can get someone to, to investigate that. Um, but yeah, cool. So we have some, uh, action items there. I'll, uh, create the issues and then see if, uh, we can kind of piece that out, um, and get some DRIs for that. Uh, but are there any other thoughts as far as application limits are concerned? Okay, cool. Then Bossy, you have a show and tell point. Hey, um, so some of you might remember that we had a, a discussion a few months ago, didn't actually check when it was, um, around how do we track individual users 
and how do we calculate the user count? So if you look at a at a dashboard or, or something and it tells you about unique users, how do we calculate that if users do not, for example, accept a cookie banner or um, they do not actually log in? And so um, we got to an agreement there, um, which was that we want to, uh, when a user doesn't even opt into a cookie banner, um, we're, we're going to consider every single event that they're sending as a as a new user because we don't have any additional information. We cannot realistically track anything about them. Um, when they opt into the cookie banner, then we, we get a, a cookie-based user ID that we're going to consider their user ID, their unique user identifier. And then on top of that, when they actually log in, we would consider that as a user, uh, as a unique identifier. Um, and the problem with that is this, all these information we already have in theory in the database, but so far um, it would have created quite complicated queries to figure out, figure this information out. And unique users is a very important metric for us to display. So it's, it's important to be able to query it fast and easily um, to showcase it in, in dashboards and so on, especially if we, uh, like with the topic before, and if we can scale to uh, millions of events, um, this still needs to be fast. And so I just wanted to quickly show how we now are able to do that. There, there's an MR that's linked there that's uh, in progress right now, but is should be merged any day, either tomorrow or latest the day after, um, which what I'm now showing is based on. I'll share my screen quickly. Right. So can you see the screen? Yep. All right, so this is um, what we normally have from an event, which is important to what, what I'm talking about. Um, so the this database uh, table is based on how the cluster, um, how the configurator worked beforehand and how, how the, the events, the tables were set up beforehand. So we, in theory, for these all these events, uh, I've said pre I've sent previously, we have uh, an event ID, which is particular to the single event. Um, for some of them, we have a domain user ID. Um, and for some of them, we have a user ID. That depends on, if you look at the example we have, for example, um, if I send an event like this um, without accepting our cookie banner, like our example cookie banner here, but if uh, someone would configure the SDK to not accept the cookie, um, to provide a cookie banner first, um, then what you would see is that you only get the event ID. This is an event like this. We don't have a domain user ID. You don't have a user ID. If I accept the cookie banner, but I don't identify the user in any other way, then I would get an event like this where I just get a domain user ID and um, the user ID field itself is still empty. And then if I would press this identify with ID one, two, three, and then track an event, then I get a user ID into, into the field. So just that that's kind of the, the status quo that we have now. And with the changes, i um, just gonna quickly change to a local version of the configurator. So the good thing about this is um, we that we have all the information already. Um, just need to quickly, I think also drop the migrations table. One sec. It's probably not working yet. I appreciate the live demo. I think that always conveys more, especially if it doesn't work. And then people mm -hmm. learn even more, like it does now. Uh, no, I just need to quickly, because the migration already ran before on a different table. It's the easiest way to get it to run from scratch again. Same thing. All right, now it's successfully migrated database. So the good thing now is that we should have um, a user or user ID filled now everywhere. So 
if I go back to my previous query. Um, what we have now, and I think I wanted to share this because I think it's important to build dashboards on and, and um, kind of use now in, in the future. So now the user ID field is filled for every one of those events. And what you can see is that you also have a user ID type. So the type for those events where there was a specific user ID sent is identify. The type for the events where we have a domain user ID, um, but no specific user ID beforehand, it's called cookie. So that's based on the cookie. And then the ones where we don't have a domain user ID, um, we're kind of carrying over the event ID and then it's called anonymous. And so with this, we should now be able to switch everything over to just use the user ID column when we talk about unique users. Um, and then we can also still think about how do we handle want to handle those anonymous users? So in theory, we could, for example, provide a um, I don't know, a filter or something to the user to say, okay, let's discard anonymous users. Um, because for example, um, I think in the metrics dictionary and a few other example projects that we currently have implemented, we don't have a cookie banner. So every single uh, kind of page view is by a new user. So your, your unique user count is quite inflated. Um, but that's something that we have under control now and we can kind of still think about how we want to handle that. I think that's it. This is great. So we've made changes then on the SDK side so that, so I guess like what, what all just needs to happen to, to roll this out because we have table migrations for existing data sets. And then we also for new data need that change needs to be reflected in the SDKs. Um, and then I assume we would also have schema changes. So like our vector or our, materialized view queries would have to change in production as well, right? Or I guess, I know, and this is very easy to get like lost in the details, but like, you know, what what are the high level steps to like, you know, bring this out to, to, to production or, or do we need to figure that out still? So if we're not mistaken, um, then we only need to update the configurator. Okay. Because this is now, everything is paid based on the configurator. We, we already got this information beforehand. Um, and the config configurator has migration capabilities now. So it, it can migrate uh, databases, tables. Um, and so the way we build the migration, it will actually also migrate all existing tables and databases. So it will go through your all your projects, take all the uh, Snowplow events tables, remove the old views, create new view that then fills in the, the, um, the new column, uh, create the new column first, and also migrate the existing data. Uh, so we use existing data to, to kind of fill in um, these these columns because in the end what we have now is just denormalized data. It's like everything's already there. Uh, we just put it into a more convenient spot to be able to use it. I think so. We just need to merge this, create a new configurator version, update the configurator everywhere, and then um, start using it. No changes in the SDK necessary, no changes anywhere else in the collection necessary. No changes in the SDK. So these migrations happen at the database? Or the, like, I guess, so we just continue sending the same we're values. Send... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. We're, we're sending the completely same values. Um, the That's why I tried to show the, the before and after of the of the same database table. Um, because we already sent all this information before and we sent the domain user ID, we sent the event IDs, we sent a user ID if a user ID a user got identified. Um, and so this information is all already there. This is the SDKs already work this way. Um, it's up to the individual where we implement the SDK to make sure that the cookie banner is accepted whenever it's accepted or that we set kind of the, the right information there. Um, or the same with this identify call. For example, on gitlab.com, we don't use this dot identify call yet uh, because um, we, we we also need to make sure that we have the proper um, anonymization in place for gitlab.com for our specific case. Um, but otherwise, this should, should just work. So with all the data that we already have, so that's that's the nice part about it. I guess for the new data, is that because the configurator is updated to extract the values differently in the views? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can actually, if 
Um, give me a sec. So maybe that makes a bit more makes it a bit more tangible. Um, yeah, I'm curious how that would work with like existing materialized views in place that are. So the materialized views are getting replaced. So we're just deleting the old one, creating a new one, and the new one. Um, just need to find it quickly. Is that the one? Yeah, I think so. So the new one fills in this user ID type, the, yeah. the last thing down here. Um, and that's the conveniently named multi if from ClickHouse. Um, this is based on the on the on the user ID. And um up here somewhere the user ID itself also got changed to um if the user ID is not empty, then keep the user ID. It. If it is empty, then and the domain user ID is not empty, then use the domain user ID. If both of those are empty, then please use the event ID. Um, so this is all happening while the event is taken from the initial queue uh, from Snowplow and then put into the specific um, event database for this specific project. Um, the, the, the user ID is extracted correctly and the user ID type is also set based on this information. Makes sense. Awesome. Right. Well, that would be good. And Rob, you have a couple points here. Did you want to uh, vocalize? Uh, yeah, sure. Just from a product and it's a specific perspective, this is great. Thank you so much for getting this done. All of the instrumentation team. Um, it now means that we are unblocked to start implementing, um, adding uh, and the type to the cube schemas, which will then also enable us to add this anonymized filter to front end to the users that use the dashboards. Um, so even though this isn't fully deployed, the MR is merged, so we can start using the configurator locally and if we want to and pull that image down. And if we wanted to start pull that in, we can do either this master or the next. Um, and the second point, the one thing that we'll need to change is well, a lot of the cube schema currently query for domain user ID. So we will need to update that to make sure it's consistently using user ID throughout. But very small change. Do we need an issue, do we need an issue for that? Just check. I do need to create an issue for that. You're right. right. Cool. Awesome. Well, good stuff. Good stuff. Thanks, Basti, for showing it off. And shout out to the analytics instrumentation team for making it happen. Cool. Then we have a minute left. Is there anything else that anyone would like to cover? All right. Well, good to see everyone. Have a good rest of your Monday. And uh, if we don't see each other later on, have a good rest of your week. <laughs>